Hi, welcome to Chorista Chronicles from Caracas number 12. My name is Jesus Rodriguez. And this week we're going to talk about the opposition, as I call it, lots in its labyrinth. Also, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, the international, especially Latin American unrest in recent days or weeks, and how we see it from Venezuela. And then I'm going to talk again a, a little bit about Orinoco Tribune's anniversary. So that's going to be it. So let's start from the beginning, talking about the opposition uh, in Venezuela and the recent attempts to heat up the streets somehow, trying to use labor issues, trying to deal with people's nerves, uh, in relation to utilities, I mean, public services like electricity, water, uh, internet, uh, and that kind of stuff. So they have been trying everything in recent days. They have been trying uh, all the tactics that I already mentioned in previous podcasts, uh, and and they have, haven't achieved any success, actually. Uh, um, Guaido called for a demonstration or a march a few days ago, and no one went there. Uh, I mean, there are not even pictures of the demonstration or big, I mean, videos uh, on the demonstration. So everyone says that it was a lame call. Uh, and he also said that... Uh, the big march is going to be on November 26th. I don't know why he chose that day, but anyway, maybe those were the instructions that he received from Washington. So let's see what happened. They have been trying to push also with some strikes, with um, some, some public schools, but not everyone joined those strikes. I mean, they have has been uh, they have been very partial, uh, not ma ma massive enough. So they have. I mean, those strikes haven't disrupted people's life like they might have wished. So I believe that uh, they are losing a lot of traction, and that's from one side is nice, and from the other, it's raised our attention because it might you know, push for radical and, you know, uh, crazy shortcuts, either from our local right-wingers or by their bosses in Washington, D.C. So let's see what happened, but things are like that in Venezuela currently. Now, the meetings, I mean, with the national dialogue table has been going on. Things are, has been kind of slow in Venezuela in recent weeks which is somehow good, but anyway, I mean, it's like we are not used to that kind of uh, ease in terms of our internal politics. What else? Um, now I want to talk about the, all the unrest in Latin America and beyond. I want to talk about what happened in Bolivia. I mean, I'm going to talk about the elections in Bolivia, Chile, and Uruguay, but also about the unrest the rebellion uh, in Chile, in Ecuador, and Haiti, and also in other places like Iran and Lebanon, and how we see it from here, from Caracas. So going uh, to the first part, I mean, elections in Bolivia, I mean, come on, I mean, the U.S. and the OAS has been dealing with some crazy narrative in which they distrust the results because they stop the counting for some time, which is very normal, especially in Bolivia that have like very distant uh, uh, local, uh, I mean, towns that are far away from the capital in the mountains. So, so. And those areas are mostly indigenous areas, and uh, and they are usually very supportive uh, of uh, pres 
in Evo Morales. So that's why when the results of those areas start coming, the, the, the small margin that Evo needed in order to avoid the second run was possible to reach. So that's what happened. I mean, come on, the guy has been uh, in power for, for more than a decade. The economy of Bolivia has been growing like any other economy in the continent. They, uh, I mean, he gained majority in the, co oh, <laughs> sorry, he gained majority in the Congress. Mm, uh, so, I mean, it was a victory, uh, a landslide victory. I mean, he had got more than 10% of difference with the other guy, Carlos Mesa. So it's crazy what they're trying to do. They are not going anywhere, disregarding that they have some right wing and locals that might, you know, uh, promote trouble. But besides that, they are not going anywhere. Disregarding that some people have been saying that they might try with the help of the U.S. again to ask Carlos Mesa to proclaim himself. But that guy might be right winger and everything, but I don't believe that that guy is crazy enough to play the uh, puppet role that Juan Guaido is playing here in Venezuela. I mean, uh, Carlos Mesa is a long-run politician from Bolivia, right-winger and everything, but I mean, uh, I, I don't think that the guy is going to play that game. Uh, so, and we a few minutes ago just hear the victory of uh, Fernandez in Argentina, so South America is moving to the left, that's for sure. And in Uruguay, also, the Frente Ampio won elections in the first round. Everyone knew that that the candidate from Frente Ampio, uh, Cárdenas, I believe is his last name, was not going to get enough votes to win in the first round. And things for Uruguay are not going to get easy in the second round that is going to happen on November 24th. But uh, if you ask me, I mean, the numbers that I saw, I just saw from the results in the elections and all this trend of South America moving to the left, accompanied by the rebellions in Chile and Ecuador and Haiti, uh, might influence in the results of these elections in, in Uruguay. And we hope, we just hope that the Frente Amplio uh, do a nice campaign in this next four weeks of campaigns that they have in order to to win uh, uh, that election. I mean, Uruguay is not like a big country like Argentina or Brazil, but, but it's an important country. Uh, and, and, and not having Uruguay in the field of the left uh, might not be good. So everyone here, at least from Caracas, are cheering for a victory of the Frente Cambrio in Uruguay uh, next November the 24th. So we are happy, and we were surprised also today by the results of the elections, local elections in Colombia. I mean, the right-winger and paramilitary leader uh, uh, Uribe uh, acknowledged the defeat of his party in a lot of places, at least in major cities. Uh, and the party of Uribe uh, did not win. And, uh, and a new left, center-left uh, leadership from, not from the traditional parties, one uh, cities like Bogota, Medellin, uh, so, uh, so so even a FARC uh, leader uh, won uh, uh, a city in this election. So uh, that's a sign. That's a sign that you know the South American people are getting read or getting tired of this right wing neoliberal policies. So let's see what happened. Uh, I believe that definitely uh, um, our countries in South America are going to move to the left again. 
and that is a company that this explosions in, in Chile and in Ecuador uh, with people just getting tired of, you know, being the ones uh, uh, putting on their shoulders the weight of international monetary found, found recipes. Uh, so that's what happened in Chile and in Ecuador and, and, and some, somehow also in ha Haiti. Uh, I mean, uh, kind of different the case of Haiti, but anyway, I mean, it's a country that has been there just because the U.S. wants them. I mean, you're in almost, say, as government uh, is still there just because the U.S. government uh, uh, has been moving all, everything in order for that to happen. So, so but that's important to highlight this. And in, in what, I mean, what happened in Ecuador uh, is important, but it's a shame that Konaye decided, uh, I mean, that the movement, the, the people's movement that promoted the, the rebellion in Ecuador was somehow kidnapped by Konaye. I, I understand that Konaye is an important organization and they have uh, a lot of uh, power in order to mobilize people, and, and they were one of the main engines in order to mobilize people in, in Ecuador, but I believe that the rebellion was bigger than Conai, and putting Conai, which has been denounced as being sympathetic to, More to Lenny Moreno, and also has been uh, denounced that having received funds by National Endowment for Democracy and USAID uh, uh, is a mistake, if you ask me. I'm not. Uh, I'm not trying not to recognize the the relevance of Konai, but you have to be careful. And I believe that what's going to happen is that eventually, as there are already signs out there, uh, uh, the indigenous movement is going to stop negotiations with uh, Correa, with uh, Lenny Moreno. I mean, and and things are going. I mean. Ecuadorians are going to go back to the street and get rid of that guy. That's when I, because that guy is an specialist in, in, in treason. So whatever he signs, whatever agreement he signs, everyone knows that uh, he is going to betray that agreement. Uh, and there's a nice piece uh, by Atilio Boron that we posted on Orinoco Tribune a few weeks ago. And in Chile, it's more complicated because no one sees it trend or a leadership among this popular uprising uh, and uh, if you ask me I believe that 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 that's not good but somehow in recent days we have been noticing at least a trend of of, of Chileans among the promoters of the of the uprising uh, uh, talking about organizing a national constituent assembly, which is something very similar, I mean, that to the Bolivarian process, I mean, to the political process led by Hugo Chavez here in Venezuela. So when we hear that here in Venezuela, it sounds nice to us, the Chavistas, I mean. So let's see what happened, and we want to keep paying attention to that, but even if those movements do not move beyond what they are, already uh, have achieved, uh, they represent a change in the way even right-wing politicians will relate to their constituents. So in any case, this is a victory. What happened in what is happening in Chile and Ecuador and Haiti is a victory of, you know, people getting rid of being screwed by uh, neoliberalism and U.S. imperialism. So let's see what happened. We are also impacted by, somehow impacted by what happened in, in, uh, in Iraq and Lebanon. From my perspective, what happens in Iraq, uh, I, I don't like uh, what is happening in Iraq because I have the impression that this uprising has been promoted by the left and the U.S. because the Iraqi government currently is seem 
pathetic or coordinates a lot with Iran and, and Syria. So I'm not an expert in Middle East issues. I, we try to keep track on Middle Eastern issues, as you know, in Orinoco Tribune, but, but from what we read, uh, 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 we don't see it clear. Uh, but of course, there's a lot of uh, denunciations of corruption. The same thing happened in Lebanon. Uh, so in the case of Lebanon, uh, I see it more like like a, a real expression of people enraged by, you know, corrupt governments or corruption in government or inefficiency or that kind of stuff. But Iraq, for me, is kind of different. So, but, but anyway, again, I'm not an expert, but I just want to mention the way I see those issues from here from Caracas. And just to end, I want to mention again uh, that we are going to celebrate, uh, we are celebrating actually right now uh, the first anniversary of Orinoco Tribune. We invite you to a Facebook live stream that we already uh, set up for November the 24th. You already created an event in uh, Facebook, and we ask for your support in order to share that event, Facebook event, uh, in order to try to have a nice interaction with our readers, mainly. Uh, and we, in the description of the Facebook uh, event, we explain what we are planning to do. So we hope to see you there, and we hope to interact with you and to celebrate uh, our first year. Of course, I have to remember how important this, the donations this last week has been very, very slow in terms of donations, and we are about to uh, make one of the biggest payments that we have to do in terms of uh, renewing uh, service providers. Uh, in order to uh, have our new hosting service, and that is a company with several other payments. So we, I, I invite you to help us with donations, or at least asking friends to that like, of course, our work to donate. So it is, it is important, and I also just to finish wanted to mention that we have been tweaking uh, and, and tuning, tuning the advertisement tools that we uh, don't want to use, but we are preparing to use in the case donations do not work. And, 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 and we're initially planning to do that for a while. But it's taking longer because we are learning. Finally, uh, like two days ago, we uh, learned how to uh, properly uh, place uh, the ads in the spots that we like and the website we want that's one of the things that we want to talk with you in that live stream on Facebook uh, we want to have your feedback about the, those ads but immediately after we finish tuning that in and I believe that that's going to happen in maybe one or two weeks I hope um, we're going to turn those ads off just to see to give it a chance for donations uh, so so I apologize because I, I have received some contacts by uh, our readers not too many but some contacts about readers having trouble with some apps the content or not letting them uh, letting them see some kind of content so I apologize and I encourage you to let us know if you face some kind of trouble and if you see something that you just like or that you find too impressive. So let us know, give us some feedback because that's why we are trying to tune in the right thing. Uh, I mean, in, in that uh, advertisement tool in order for, I mean, if we decide to uh, turn that option back on, uh, we have everything already set up. So that's the idea. Uh, so I, I want to tune in that feature the best way possible to have a good balance between ads and content, uh, uh, not being intrusive, I mean, not having 
too many uh, ads, but at the same time having ads in order to have a reasonable income. And, and that is the complicated part because whatever you do in that in those tools, it usually takes some time in order to you uh, for you to see the changes. But anyway, I don't want to bother you with this, uh, and I hope to see you in that Facebook live stream on November the 24th. Thank you for listening to us, and hope to see you next week. Bye bye.